Hello, and you are listening to Squash Radio. This is a brand new podcast that wants to bring the inside of squash to life by serving up the best stories. We are launching this channel with some in-depth interviews with some great people from the squash world. But we're also trying a little experiment first by doing two versions of each interview. One is the full-length interview that Squash Radio had with each guest, and two is a more produced version that takes some of the highlights from each conversation. Making those cuts is actually pretty challenging since we think it's all great content. But let us know what you think. Should we continue to do both? Send us an email to squashradio at gmail.com. Also, if you have any great stories that involve squash, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. We hope you enjoyed today's episode and thank you for listening. What about this? This call is being recorded. Hey there, Squash fans, and welcome again to Squash Radio. We have a great guest for you today. He is based out of Philadelphia, and he is someone who I think is completely fascinating and one of the most interesting people I've had the pleasure to meet. That is the one and only Dr. Eric Zilmer, who is the athletic director and Carl R. Pacifico Professor of Neuropsychology at Drexel University. Dr. Zilmer has been a transformational force for Drexel Athletics. He's helped to drive excellence both within the department as well as for the student athletes achieving amazing results both on and off the field. On the academic side, he has published several books, one of which is called Military Psychology. But he has also published more than 100 journal articles and appears regularly on local and national media outlets covering a range of topics including sports psychology, neuropsychology, forensic psychology, and the psychology of terrorism. For his work on the military and understanding the psychology of terrorism, he has been one of the few civilians invited by the Pentagon as a distinguished visitor to go to Guantanamo Bay. But another great way to learn about Dr. Zilmer are the organizations and committees that he serves outside of his day job. They reflect his own diverse range of passions and interests, from sports, arts, culture activities, and civic duty. He serves on the executive board of the Philadelphia Sports Congress, the Philadelphia Classical Guitar Society, the International House of Philadelphia, the Austrian Society of Pennsylvania, advisory board member to the local urban program, Squash Marts, as well as serves on the Olympic Sports Liaison Committee between the NCAA and the USOC. Dr. Zilmer was born in Tokyo, Japan, raised in Europe, and is bilingual in English and German. He has a passion for arts and has exhibited work in Italy and Philadelphia. He studies and plays the classical guitar, but also produces events around the community. For sports, he enjoys golf, tennis, court tennis, and of course, squash. So I got to know Dr. Zilmer while I was working at US Squash as the event CEO of the US Open. We worked together as part of the team to turn the US Open into the great event it is today with its unique venue layout, its fantastic on and off court programming, as well as it became the first squash tournament in history to offer parity and prize money for both men and women at the World Series level. In the extended version of this interview, you'll hear him talk about his trip to Guantanamo Bay, how he transitioned from being a psychology professor to the athletic director. But in this selected version, we cover the before and after picture of the Drexel Athletics with Dr. Zilmer. We dive into the reasons for his success and how he approaches his leadership role. And naturally, we talk about squash and how Drexel built up its program, as well as Dr. Zimmer's thoughts on college squash and the NCAA. And of course, don't forget to stay tuned for the quickfire section of this program. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed having this conversation with Dr. Zilmer, and we uh, we hope you do too. So without further ado, here we go. There is a clear before and after picture from when Dr. Zilmer took over being director of athletics at Drexel. And this is where we join in in the conversation. Would, just to give some context, would you mind giving a kind of before Dr. Zilmer took over director of athletics almost 20 years ago now and where it is, you know, where it was then and where it is today? Well, one of the things 
that I think I appreciate doing, and I feel I know you well, I think you're the same, is to build things, to create things, to look into spaces that haven't been really explored, rather than managing and taking care of things. So when I took over athletics, it wasn't in great shape. I mean, that's why they were making a change. So at the time, I mean, really very few people cared about Drexel Athletics. We had a good basketball program, but that was just about it. We had a building with no windows. We raised $40,000 a year. We were playing local teams. And, um, yeah, it was, it was that kind of a situation. However, we're, we were Division One, so the opportunity for us was, was really great to, to be something more than, than we were. And since then, we've joined a, a new conference with really great national schools like, you know, the College of William & Mary mm-hmm. or the College of Charleston. We are playing now a national schedule. You know, we just beat Oregon State in wrestling last week. We beat Georgetown in swimming uh, just this week. You know, we don't always win our our matches, of course, but we try to play a national schedule. And we're trying to also excel at a national and even an international level. And so our our wrestling team this, this year has been ranked top 25. As you know, our men's team in squash is ranked number five right now in the country, and our women number 13, our women's basketball Right now is number one in the ESPN mid-major poll, and our field hockey and lacrosse teams have always been a perennial top 20 contender. So, and, and, and we're raising now you know, between 2 and $4 million a year and have over 2,000 donors. So we've, uh, we've come a long way. <laughs> yeah, um, no, it's impressive. I mean, you're, you've been the core driver of the athletics. And I mean, what was... Um, what do you credit your success or your focus on being able to accomplish that? Well, I think two things, Connor, is the people you surround yourself with. And, uh, you know, you meet so many great people, interesting people skiing because you're sitting on a chairlift with them. Yeah. And for, for 15 minutes, I met this, this person who was a CEO of a company uh, called Computer Science Corporation. And in, that's a company with 120,000 employees. And I said, what's your most difficult task you're dealing with day in, day out. And he said, people. <laughs> so whether it's a really whether it's a really large company or whether it's something like an athletics department, you have to surround yourself with the right people. And I, I really believe that everybody who works for Drexel Athletics believes in what they do. They they just do. They have a passion about it. And so I've also been working with the same people, many of them who you know uh, for really 18, 19 years. We, we've been yeah. a team that's had a stability. The other thing I believe is leadership. I mean, we, in, in, we have a president at Drexel University, John Fry, who's just an amazing, creative, innovative, personable leader. And when you have good leadership, uh, it allows you to you know, be at peace with yourself and explore things that you're not afraid to explore. And so I think those two things are really, really important. For you to be a leader to your department, what are some things that you try and, and do for your team to support them? I think you have to be true to yourself. You know, for myself, I'm a leader who likes to create a social environment. You know, I'm not very good at, at organizing tasks. I hire people to do that. I'm not saying that that's, everybody should be like me, but I think you need to know your strengths and weaknesses when you're a leader. And of course, you know, in psychology, we, we study leadership. We wonder whether, it, whether you're born a leader, you know, like Winston Churchill, or whether you can learn to be a leader, like these thousands of, of retreats that have, you know, these business gurus come. I, I once went to one of them, and they, they had all these books like, you know, first break all the rules from good to better or whatever. I go like, those are great books, but has anybody ever read War and Peace by Tolstoy? I mean, you can learn a lot about business from that book. Because I've always been kind of going against the grain about just you know, leadership by paint the numbers. So I try to create a social environment where we're like a community, we're a family. We look out for each other. We have a passion. And I think that kind of chemistry is very, very important. It's hard to create because what you're creating is culture. You know, it's the hardest thing. But if you if you think about some of the companies like Tesla uh, right now, I have to drive one, so I, I follow them. 
or Apple, I would say maybe 10, 15 years ago. I mean, those are companies that are not Google now. They, they create culture. And Google, their, their primary culture is that you work in teams, that you don't have an ego, and that you have a global view of the world. I mean, I would subscribe to that. So that's the hardest thing to do is to, is to create that culture. And you can't do it alone. You need all those people to help you. So when people say like, well, you've accomplished a lot, I don't, I don't really see it that way at all. I feel that, you know, the people that work for me or work with me in sort of a horizontal fashion have accomplished all those things yeah. because I let them, because I let them. Yeah, I mean, uh, the subject of leadership it, to me is, is fascinating. And my wife actually, she works at Deloitte and does a lot of this as well. And, you know, one of the things that really I, I've had to be, whether it's when I was the captain of my squash team, you know, suddenly thrusted into those positions or, or being senior leadership at uh, U.S. Squash, it was kind of daunting. And I wish I had had this advice when I was was younger was, um, you know, we always look towards other models for success. And I think what you just said really resonates with me in terms of being authentic to yourself and finding your own leadership style. And that kind of comes back to squash a little bit where I, I really like the way Nick Matthew plays or Ramia Shore. I can't play like that. So, you know, finding your own style and, and taking parts from everyone else, but then building your own, I think is, is really, it's hard to do, but it's, I think that's the best way of, of approaching it. Well, you're look. Like- Connor, you're a very unique, a very unique person. The series that you're doing on Squash Radio is fantastic, and you know we've been so lucky to have you be part of. When we started the U.S. Open for men's and women's squash at Drexel and hosting it, we were so lucky to have you be our partner uh, because I think you are very much uh, like I am. You're like an artist, and you see things in different ways, and you take risks. And what you have created, and what has really developed since then. Uh, is, in my opinion, really uh, a significant event. So a sporting event, international sporting event, which is fascinating to watch. Next, we will wind the clock a little bit to the humble beginnings of the Drexel Squash Program. Dr. Zilmer walks us through where it began and where it is today. We also talk more about the big picture of squash and the relationship with the NCAA and get his unique thoughts and position on this. It was just an opportunity I mean, you just, you know, I, uh, I started playing squash in the 1990s. I'm a, I'm a competitive tennis player. But we had these courts, these North American courts at Drexel. And my department head played squash. And I said, let's play because, I, I mean, I can play tennis. How hard can it be, right? And he, and he, just, he just whipped me. <laughs> I mean, it was just and because, because he was better than me and because he was my authority figure, I challenged him. You know, every week to a match, I don't think I ever beat him. <laughs> and and so I was introduced to squash, and it was very interesting to me. And then when I became athletic director, I, I kept playing. As you know, it's a great workout. It's just like so much fun. And then I always thought these squash courts that we have in the basement, and as you know from just traveling around the country, there's like all, all these relics, right? These North American squash courts. They're even in our league. Uh, at some of the universities, they use them for storage. You know, so yeah. like, and and I always dreamed that one day we could like convert them into something better. And then in 2001, uh, we started Squash Smarts at Drexel. We had you know two wonderful women came to my office, and uh, Lisa Stokes and Pam Endy, and they came and said, "Hey, we have this this." The nonprofit, this community outreach program where sport is a catalyst for social change and inner city youth. And mind you, Connor, I get that every week, okay? Right. People want to use our facilities, and of course, you want to help people as much as you can. But they, they made so much sense, and they were so elegant and charming. And I was thinking, God, I have these, these courts. I really don't use them very often. Why don't we start that? So we started Squash March in 2001. We got uh, Lenfist to help us with some of the funding. Chase Lenfist, he's very generous. He's a squash player from Yale, as you know. Mm-hmm. And then over the years, uh, we created this little culture of squash smarts. And what happened then is we had intermurals for the first time. And after three, four years, we had a club sport. This was all related to starting squash smarts in this space with North American courts. And so by the time in 2011, we were talking about professional squash at Drexel and a, and a varsity team. We've been playing club uh, squash for five years and had squash marts for 11 or 10 years. So 
we were, you know, so it would be, it would have been harder to go from zero to a hundred miles per hour in one day, but we were working on this for a while, but we never thought about making it varsity until we had the opportunity to do so with the leadership that we had at Drexel and the opportunity to host the U S open. So then we jumped into this idea and it, it just really, it just shows you sort of the process of creativity and taking advantage of the situation that presents yourself because all of the things we've done since then have been just fantastic. So yeah. it was the right decision for our university and for our athletic department. And, and we've made so many friends and we've been just, you know, we our program is six years old. And the other day we, we played, a, I went to the match uh, that we played against Yale at Drexel and we have, I mean, the place is packed. We have hundreds and hundreds of people watching this incredible match and college squash is fantastic. Gosh, I wish I, I would just be plucked from my current job and put into some squash club at the age of 10 and start all over again. It'd be so much fun. And yeah. it was amazing. And if you think that this culture was created within six years at this high level, it, it's hard to believe. So, you know, it gives you a sense of pride and what's possible. And of course we couldn't have done it without, U.S. squash and without uh, my leadership at the university, specifically John Fry, who was, a, was an amazing leader and a, and a very uh, good squash player himself. Speaking as an athletic director, and if you're talking to other athletic directors in there, because now Drexel has distinguished itself um, into a, an amazing uh, squash program, what would you tell them in terms of why should our athletic department consider doing a squash program? Yeah, it's a tough, uh, you know, I think it's a tough one. This is going on at the University of Virginia right now. I just visited their complex. It's beautiful. But, you know, the interesting thing about Virginia is you, you see they're, they're right next door to their tennis complex. Of course, I checked that out because I like to play tennis. And they won a national championship in 2015 in men's tennis, right? Which is an amazing accomplishment, okay? Yeah. yeah. It's it sounds easy, unbelievable. To win a national championship is an amazing accomplishment. And so I think... For a school that's already really well established, and by the way, Virginia is doing great. They have a great pro there, and I think the best is yet to come for them. Um, but for a program like that, who who is really, I mean, Virginia is one of the top ten athletic departments in our country, and their goal is to be number one. You know, I would say UCLA or Stanford might be at that right now. But for those kind of programs, what would you really add if you already are functioning at that kind of high level, right? Yeah. And, and, then, and then for programs that are more like what we call mid-majors, like in our conference, you know, we, we're struggling with finances uh, at every turn. So we're, we're not thinking about adding sports. I mean, we want to compete in the sports that we have. And, you know, more isn't necessarily better. So I, would I think it would take a really creative leap of faith to do something like squash. But I do think it is the right thing. You know, I'm on the uh, NCAA Olympic Liaison Committee, so I go to Colorado Springs with, as part of the Olympic Assembly and the meeting of the United States Olympic Committee. And my role is to help facilitate any of the 45 boards, they're called National Governing Bodies, NGBs, to see if there's anything in the, in the college environment that restricts potential Olympians or Olympians from really doing what, what they need to do to win a medal. As you know, we won 121 medals in Rio, of which 30 were won by student athletes and 80% former student athletes. And so as part of that meeting, I, I was given a information about how many sports were added in the United States of America in the collegiate environment. And it's not more than 10. Okay? And then you also see how many sports were cut. And there were about 20 cut. So there's actually the culture right now in, in intercollegiate athletics is to have less sports not more sports, less sports because it's expensive and it's becoming ever more expensive to have high-level NCAA Division I sports. And so I think that's what you're going against. You're really swimming upstream. However, you know, it's not impossible. I think in some cases, it's the right thing to do. And I, I do think that for college squash, the best is yet to come and that more programs will see what is possible. But I hear that all the time, like, oh, look what they did at Drexel. Why don't we do that here? Well, you're, you're saying that to somebody, a program that doesn't even, that didn't have, you know, 10 years of squash, intramural club sport 
uh, squash marks culture. It would be like a completely new sport, like saying to the University of Florida, let's start skiing. Yeah, so, so I think it's possible, but I think it is difficult. Well, I think um, there are elements to draw on from the example of Drexel. And I, I do actually, I do get asked this uh, a fair amount. And I say, look, it's hard to go overnight. Um, you know, most overnight su- or perceived overnight successes have a, a strong legacy of years of, of, of hard work and uh, accomplishments before then, right? So I, I think to your point is find an inroad and start building a program in some capacity, be it um, you know a strong club program or getting the faculty involved, or if you have courts, getting the students involved and you know really bridging that gap. Um, I completely agree. I think it's it's too much to go from zero to one hundred. Uh, but, over- yeah, what what has been accomplished is terrific. You know, as part of this committee I told you about, I work with USA Archery who's struggling to go from club sports to varsity status or women's wrestling that's struggling or wants to go from club status to varsity status. And I think both sports will, uh, and both are Olympic sports. And in both sports, we, America wins Olympic medals. In this case, squash is much more already defined as a collegiate sport. I will tell you this, Connor, every ounce of sweat that I have put into college squash my return of investment, my ROI has been phenomenal. Mm. And the fact that it's a global sport, international and international perspective, and that the students, the American students who come and play are, are great kids from great families, I think, I think it was a no-brainer. I, just, I believe it was one of the best decisions that we made collectively at Drexel University. And so, you know, having said about all the challenges, for me... It was a great opportunity to build our program and, and to see remarkable kids from all over the world playing at a very high level against some of the best schools in our country. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, headline news, uh, Drexel University beats Yale. Uh, Drexel University beats UPenn, five, both 5-4 five, matches. I mean, that's, uh, those are nice w- notches uh, to have under your belt for sure. We're, we're very lucky. We're very fortunate to have some great players. We very much respect those teams you mentioned uh, because we respect them. We try to put forward our best effort. Uh, those are so, but just to be named with teams like that and play them to that level is really fascinating. Right now, uh, squash is not recognized as an NCAA sport, and you know, I mean, if we could kind of put out a, what do you think are some of the steps that? Uh, as a sport, we would need to do in order to close that gap, either on the men's side or the women's side. It would be easier on the women's side. You know, we still have Title IX issues as a, as a sport organization with the NCAA, primarily because there's no equivalence to football. You know, so you introduce men's football at 100 participants with 80 scholarships, roughly. You're going to have to find the equivalent culture for women. So it would be a lot easier on the women's side, plus the demographics are such that more and more women are going to college. And one way to measure Title IX is proportionality and participation. So on the women's side, it would be much better. And as you know, uh, women's squash was an emerging sport for the NCAA. So I feel that some efforts should be made, and I would be willing to participate in those efforts to put an application together to have women's squash be an NCAA emerging sport. And what would that do is it would uh, legitimize squash, I think, for both men and women, because you have that in crew. You know, the women are NCAA and the men are not. So it can create some tension, but I think it legitimizes legitimizes squash for both sports. It gives you support from the organizational support from the NCAA. Uh, and it also gives you money. You get every time you sponsor a team in the NCAA, you get a certain amount of money. So in men's, men's basketball, it wouldn't be a lot of money because you spend so much money in basketball. But for squash, Uh, where the budgets aren't as high, I think it would make a difference. So let's say you have 40 teams that play or 30 teams that play women's uh, squash at this level. It would be those 30 schools. You would invest those, that money you would get for the 30 schools back into the sport. And I think for, uh, as you know, there's less women playing squash than men. And if you put the NCAA logo on women's squash, I think more girls would go into the sport because they can see the recognition that has been embraced by a very large, very successful 
a sports organization, namely the NCAA. So I, I'm a complete proponent of this, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to get other schools to think the way I do and, and to make this a reality. So I think that's something we could work. That would be the first step uh, moving it into that direction. Having said that, I think the CSA and, and uh, U.S. Squash is doing a great job in, in organizing squash at the highest level that they can. I completely agree with with that, and you know, one of the things. So, what if uh, we have some squash parents or even some squash players listening? Is there anything that the community can do to help this case, or you know, is there anything we can we can ask or rally behind that you think you can think of? Well, there, there's a, a couple of good signs. One is, you know, we lost women's squash. Lost when when we started squash. It was, or it was a few years before, it was still an NCAA emerging sport. You see, so I felt like, wow, that could, I could put that into the, uh, in my umbrella of sports. I have 18 sports, of, of which 15 are NCAA. Men's crew, men's and women's squash or not. And, but since then, they reformed that committee because, Connor, it's kind of silly to have an emerging sport and then take that status away again, right? Right. So <clears throat> you were trying to build it forward and build it out. So they reformed that committee. Uh, it's it's very, I think it's a very good committee and with very good objectives. And so to get that to happen, parents really have very little to do. It would be the universities that would support that. You would need at least 10 letters of support from different programs. And you need to have at least 20 to 30 of those programs in place right now or have a very strong club sport culture. For women's intercollegiate squash, we, we have that. So we have that in place. So all we would need to do is do it if, if that's what the sport would want to do. So I believe that squash is already well on the way in terms of its organizational structure to accomplish that. But I don't believe that everybody's on the same page that this is one of their goals. I'm eager to help in any way I can. And uh, we couldn't be more fortunate as a sport to have someone like you and uh, both in personality, but then leadership and vision involved uh, helping to drive that. So uh, from the squash community, thank you very much for everything you've, you've done. I've had the distinct pleasure of working closely with Drexel University, but more specifically their athletic department. Overall, they do an outstanding job and were a true pleasure to collaborate with. So I wanted to take a little time and get Eric's thoughts on what he thinks makes Drexel so unique. Well, Drexel, the reason I was attracted to Drexel, and I came from the University of Virginia at the time, which is a phenomenal institution. But I feel that institutions that have been very successful in the past play defense. They try to keep what they've accomplished. And that universities like Drexel that are innovative and that are creative play offense. And I certainly like to play on a team that tries to score a goal. And, and so I always felt being at, at a place like Drexel, a technological school in principle, uh, you know, learning by doing, uh, that focuses on innovation in a global context, has been the right place for me. You know, nobody says, nobody says no at Drexel. You, know, you might have to find your own resources, but they go, like, it's a good idea. Well, well maybe we should try that. So it's, a, it's been a great place to be innovative. And as it turns out, in 2017, Connor, I mean, what are you going to try to accomplish in higher education? Are you just going to teach these students a bunch of facts or a well-laid-out curriculum? Or are you going to teach them to solve the problems of tomorrow? So critical thinking, learning by doing, innovation, you know, that's what's going to, that's what's going to make people successful tomorrow. You know, pursuing your dreams, and, uh, and I, I, so I'm really happy at Drexel intellectually. I teach in the honors program now, and it's a great, interesting program because they're not really tied to a curriculum. There's no curriculum in honors. They all, all the students, of course, have majors, but the dean of the honors college, Paula Cohen, she said, Eric, we want you to teach the honors program, but you can teach anything you want. Think about that. I mean, it's a good question, really. It's really a good question for you, too. I mean, what would you teach, Connor, if you could teach anything for anything you want? <laughs> we'll get back to that later, then. No, but, I, I, 
I, I, oh. <laughs> I actually, I've, I've given this a fair amount of thought because, um, you know, for me, I, I struggled in academia, you know, I, and part of the reason for that is if I don't understand why this is going to be useful, I, I don't like to waste my time. And I, th- I think when you're a student going through that, um, that was very cloudy and milky for me, you know, now in, in business and, and being kind of, uh, set free. I mean, just taking even this podcast, for example, I was like, oh my God, I, I can't wait to do this. I knew nothing of podcasting. You figure it out. So what I'd like to teach is how to, uh, pr- I guess, problem solving, creative thinking, and um, would be the two biggest things. And then stimulating curiosity. So that kind of like those three pillars and just, just cycling through that. Yeah. I mean, stimulating curiosity. Uh, those are great words. I, I haven't used those words, but I will. Because you know, if you think that the question is more important than the answer, if you believe that implicit learning, you know, learning that is sort of coincidental is more important than ex- explicit learning where you're giving a list of Latin words and now you have to memorize them, then, then I think you're creating an environment where students can feel they can take risks intellectually. It's safe for them. I'm not their teacher. I'm like one of them. I'm their peer. And we're going to go on a journey together. And it really doesn't matter what you teach. I mean, last year I taught a literature course for the first time in my life. This year I'm teaching a new course. I've never taught the rise of ISIS. I just, I'm just trying to teach something interesting and use it as a catalyst for them to think critically. And I think the word that's going to be used in the next 10 years is adaptive intelligence. Mm. You know, that's what we're trying to get students to you know, dip into, I mean, you know about emotional intelligence or social intelligence, even older word, but the, the term adaptive intelligence comes out of the artificial intelligence community. And it really means that whatever the situation that you're going to be in, you're going to be able to solve it, but you're going to have the, you're going to have the tools to do that. And those tools you can learn in college. So, so uh, do be continued. I don't have all the answers, you know, uh, I'm just part of the process, but, but that's, I think that's what Drexel uh, coming back to your original question, I think Drexel does a really good job, Drexel University, in terms of creating this culture on a campus where the impossible might just be possible. Now it's time for the quick fire portion of our interview. This is where I ask each guest the same questions to hear their range of answers and advice. If you have any questions you'd like our guests to answer, or if you have a great answer to one of these questions yourself, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Either way, we hope you enjoy this portion of Squash Radio. So I'd like to switch into just the closing part of this segment, and uh, it's been so much fun. But um, this is just some quick fire questions, so uh, you can be as quick or as long with your answers. But um, uh, I just wanted to, to switch gears. So uh, your favorite mode of transportation? What is it? Well, I have I own two motorcycles, a Harley and a Vespa, and I would go with the Italian Vespa. Italian. Now, having said that, my Tesla is being charged right now in my garage, and it's having a uh, it's crying right now because I didn't mention it. <laughs> it is an amazing automobile, but when you put it all together, I I would take you on my best spot if I would have to take you somewhere. Well, I hope that's a promise. Um, um, favorite so movie Twitter. favorite movie or documentary? Yeah, just watch 13th. Uh, everybody should watch it. It's a new documentary. I believe it's by Netflix on on our prison system and, it, and uh, we, the fact that we incarcerate 2% of our of our population. I love documentaries. You know, isn't real life always more interesting than fiction? Mm-hmm. What is it something, uh, either an activity or something physical that has given you disproportionate happiness? Yeah, music. I mean, I play guitar. Uh, I've been playing music all my life. I play, I study the classical guitar. I produce guitar concerts. You know, I, I, I would say differently. I, I would like to write a poem, Connor, and the title would be Things I've Never Regretted. Mm. And so what are some of the things that you've never regretted? And I've never regretted putting on a record. I've never regretted lighting a candle. I've never regretted opening a can of tennis balls. I've never regretted hitting, you know, a squash ball. 
So, but in all of that, I, w- I would say music is just a, is an amazing medium of, of communication. Completely agree. And um, one thing I'd have to uh, tell the audience is also we're going to get you, we're going to have play some of your music at the end here. So stay tuned. Um, <laughs> um, is there anything new that you're thinking of trying and why? Well, you know, I, I love to travel. And I always, I don't know if this is true for you. Have you ever, like, when you when you go to a really beautiful place and, you know, the fact that we're able to travel uh, like we do with modern aviation is just, it's just, if you think about it, it's truly amazing. and Mind-blowing. Yeah, in the 11th century, the average person wouldn't move further away from the place that they were born more than three miles. Three miles, so they would live within a three mile radius their entire life, have a family, kids, live, get born, die. And, uh, you know, we travel so much and it's so exciting. And one of my biggest challenges is whether I want to go back to the place I just discovered or uh, whether I want to go to a new place. And my answer always is I want to go to a new place. I, I find traveling to different cultures so inspiring. So I would say the answer is to travel to new destinations. I like it. What is uh, one of the most inspiring talks or pieces of video that you would recommend for someone that they could find on on the web easily? Malcolm, yeah, Malcolm Gladwell, the writer for the the New Yorker magazine, who has many books out now. Outlier, Tipping Point, or a couple. He's I like just so inspir- He's so inspirational. Would Would you like? Uh, David and Goliath. Uh, he's one of my favorite writers. David, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I and I got to meet him. And he oh, was really? a keynote speaker at the, our American Psychological Association conference in Boston. And I've also seen him present at the University of Pennsylvania. And I invited my entire athletic department to come along because I truly believe, even though he's a pop psychologist, and by the way, he knows that. So he, he's not pretentious at all. He's really one of the most entertaining, interesting people. Yeah. But the idea of the tipping point, you know, we, we discussed this as an athletic conference in the mid uh, 2005 or so, and and we really thought, you know, we're right there. What do we need to do to just push us over the edge? And and, and Connor, four years later, within four years, VCU and George Mason, two schools in our conference, went to the Final Four in men's basketball, which, as you probably know, is the holy grail. And then this other book, Outliers, uh, you should read it because oh, I, I think you're an out, I think books. you're an, I think you're an outlier. <laughs> <laughs> And what he what he taught me, and I think that's the key for 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 people to understand, is the advantage of disadvantage. Mm-hmm. Think about that. You know, the idea that you know, like I was a failed athlete. I would gee, I would lose more often than I would win. But but because of all that, it created resiliency in my uh, in my life. And so I, in a way, it's an advantage to have gone through what I have gone. Uh, a, a, a career full of injuries and lost hopes and <laughs> defeats. Whereas my sister was the top 10 in the world. I'm not even top 10 at the local squash club. So, um, yeah, I would, I would recommend him. He, he's, uh, one of my favorite authors. I completely agree. It's, it's a, he, he tackles f- seemingly uninteresting subjects and makes them completely fascinating. And um, to your point, uh, David and Goliath really highlights that of what is a perceived disadvantage that, yeah, it creates adversity, but then when people are able to overcome adversity, I mean, they, they are ahead of the pack. So um, I, when, when you look at that book, of course I, I read all of his books and then David Goliath, <clears throat> he talks about, <clears throat> he actually did some research about David, the underdog. And you found out that when there's a clear underdog in a sporting event, 30% of the time, that underdog wins. Whereas you would think conceptually, the chances are probably 1%. Right? 1% yeah. yeah, of course, they're not more than 50%. They're the underdog. Yeah. So I tell my teams, I mean, it's a great trick of sports psychology that if you're the underdog, you're at an advantage. And, and in other words, you know, you want to be the underdog. Of course, you want to be the flat out favorite, like, Patriots are probably in Monday Super Bowl, but <laughs> right, but um, right. you you wanna you wanna be the underdog. So uh, it's a great. What, he uses sports as a metaphor for some of his analyses, which I also very much appreciate. He, he's a long distance runner. He's a marathon runner, mm. and I think he 
he has a passion for sports that comes out in his books as well. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, next question. If you had to give a TED Talk, but the rules were it, you couldn't speak about something that you're known for, what would you want to go explore and then share? Well, I don't know if I'm known. I don't know if I'm known for anything. <laughs> I I love the concept of the TED Talks in my class. Mm -hmm. As you as you know, I love writing, but boy, I mean, by the time a kid's 21 years old, and it's going to be hard to read all these papers. You know, I I have my t my kids, the students, do TED Talks in class. Oh no way! Because I, yeah, that's their final project. Because I feel that they have to sort of emotionally embrace their topic. And I think it's going to be a lot more useful in their lives when they have to present an idea or a journey in front of a group or in front of a person or in a job interview. You know? But the thing about, to answer your question, I've developed this great passion over the last five years where I'm a complete amateur at, and that would be gardening. Mm. And I, I just love taking care of plants. I think I love taking care of people. And I just have, I mean, I think you've been to my flat. I have all these yeah. plants and herbs. I just bought a greenhouse. I just love it. I love growing things. I love watering them. I try to learn about it. It's very complicated. When you go to a horticultural meeting, they, they talk Latin and Greek. That's not what I'm talking about. I look at it as like a source of life. And I would like to figure out a way to do a TED Talk about gardening, which I know nothing about, but not talk about it academically and intellectually, to truly talk about you know, what it is about growing something that makes you feel so special and it's so beautiful. Plus, in some cases, you can, you can also cook, you know, eat it and, and cook, which, by the way, is my second passion, which I'm trying to learn more, too. So it'll be cooking and gardening. I like it. Uh, I, I, I too have recently got uh, over the past, I don't know, two, three, four or five years. Um, cooking has become an increased part of my life. And really it's, I was listening to this podcast and, um, a similar personality type to me, which is INTJ described it pretty well is like, um, there were so many long-term projects that we work on in life yet cooking for me is this kind of, uh, it's a specific task and you have to set your goal but then um, what you want to try and accomplish. And then in the cooking process, sometimes, like you said, you have to adapt, you know, oh, I made it too sweet. How do you, you know, how do you counterbalance that? And, you know, what, and then what I like is that within an hour or two, you have results and, uh, and they're, they're fun to taste the results. And, and then you get to think about what you want to do next and improve. So um, anyway, that's my <laughs> take on cooking. Um, last question. If you were to recommend any books about psychology for someone that wanted to get into it, and um, what would be a recommendation for an intro level and then kind of the, the progression from that? Well, I don't, you know, even though I write academic books, I, I don't suggest anybody read them. I feel <laughs> that that was a way yeah, of Yeah, just even knowing, about the field. Yeah. Yeah, uh, smart you are. So when I think about psychology now... I think of literature, Connor. You know, I feel um, that literature is psychology because you can only make characters come alive if you're really good at understanding human behavior. And so, you know, whether if you want to learn about psychology as a primer, you can pick up any introduction to psychology book. I mean, they are well done encyclopedias about human behavior. But if you want to, like sit at the edge of your seat and, and talk of, and read about something that involves psychology, but they don't say it's psychology. I would recommend uh, a book like The Chess Story by Stefan Zweig, Z-W-E-I-G, who, whose writings were, uh, the, were, were the initiation for the Grand Budapest Hotel. And that book is only 90 pages long. And you... And it's chock full of psychology. So, in fact, many biographers now say that Zweig, who was a friend of Sigmund Freud, was basically a psychologist, except he, he, read, he, he wrote literature. And so I really feel now at this part of my life, uh, I love getting, getting into literature and understanding human behavior through the lens of literature. 
And that's that's where I'm right now. So I would recommend that book uh, or Death in Venice, Thomas Mann. It's a fascinating book. And as you may know, these two books are very short. You know, as, as I get very, very busy, I don't recommend things like Moby Dick anymore. <laughs> like books like that, they yeah. would take forever. But if you can capture something in 50, 60, 70 pages or even a short story, I'm reading Hemingway's short stories right now. Uh, it's fascinating, you know, uh, and I and I believe absolutely convinced that that's the highest level of psychological introspection. What do you mean by that? I mean that those that Hemingway, he didn't study psychology, but he was an acute observer of human behavior. Okay, acute, one of the best. Mm. And so and so when he writes about human behavior, it is from that perspective. So I see psychology in it completely. You know, and so I feel that that that's one way or the best way to get to understand human behavior is to read about it. You know, so so I've I, I've gotten more away from the academic writings that you know we use to measure each other how smart we are to reading accounts of human behavior that are written by people who are truly introspective about the human condition. I like it. Well, I actually am so thankful for you being on the show and, and making time. And I could probably literally do this all day and um, that wouldn't be fair to you or, or other people. But um, so I'm going to I'm going to wrap it up here. But again, uh, I just want to thank you so much for your time. And, and also, you know, on behalf of the sport, I mean, you really are a leader uh, for the sport of squash and um, in sports in general. And, and so thank you for your time and thank you for everything you do. Honor, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you. All right. Well, well. Until next time, um, we'll, hopefully we can get you on sometime. Uh, maybe make this more routine. But uh, really appreciate your time. So thank you, Eric. Yeah. Thanks, Connor. Well, thank you so much for your time today and for joining us on Squash Radio. We hope you enjoyed this latest episode. But before you leave, we just have one quick last message. As you know, Squash Radio wants to help tell some of the best stories from Squash World. But in order to do that, we want and welcome your help. Do you know a person or a story that involves squash that is interesting, funny, moved you, you care about, reflects your passion for the sport? Well, share it with us and let's try and get it out there on the air. You can email me at squashradio at gmail.com or reach out to us on social media. Again, thanks for your time and... Well, until next time, be well and have fun. Bye.